A couple of uh, announcements. Uh, I talked, or texted some with Jeff today. He sent out a report. Uh, looks like they did a great job, and in two or three weeks we'll give a report. And then a week from Saturday, 7.30 a.m., our men's prayer breakfast right back here in the fellowship hall. And those are the only, only announcements right now. Pray for the Israel trip. In the last four days, four, or three weeks, we've had several people drop out, several people come on, more drop out. It's been fluid. But we still have, about, total is still about the same. So everything's good there. We just have a lot of last minute last minute changes how shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word thy word have i hid in my heart that i might not sin against thee thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path jesus prayed to the father sanctify them in truth thy word is truth for the grass withers and the flower fades but the word of our god shall stand forever Before we get started, we'll have a few moments of silent prayer, and then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, we're just thankful for the good report that Jeff gave on uh, his ministry down in Brazil during the last week and the way in which this is uh, teaching some Bible study methods, especially uh, hermeneutics is really having a a tremendous impact on the pastors down there and they're uh, getting the tools to study your word so that's great father we're also thankful for uh, Jim Meyer's ministry in Zambia the last three weeks and uh, he was to return home yesterday and father we pray that all is well with him and he can recover from that trip And Father, we pray for us as a congregation that we might continue to be steadfast on the proclamation of the truth of your word, teaching uh, the whole counsel of your word. And so, Father, we pray for us tonight as we uh, probe into what the scriptures teach about the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen. All right, open your Bibles with me to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, and we're starting to look at this question of who was Jesus. There's different parts to this. Who was Jesus before he came? Who was Jesus when he came? And who is Jesus now? Uh, Coming to understand some of these important distinctions. And it's always interesting for people who are just studying church history to realize it took about 250 years or or a little more, to fully understand and articulate uh, what we come to think about so easily in terms of the hypostatic union and the Trinity. And so we'll get into some of those historical aspects as we go along. This is really sort of a a sub-series, a basic sub-series on uh, Christology, basic understanding of the person of Christ. So our Lord was concerned about this, and he asked the disciples... In Matthew 16, 13, when they came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said this and that, really. Some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. Others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Now, this location is... On this map at Caesarea Philippi is about uh, 20 miles or so to the north of Beth- Bethsaida, which is on the uh, northern coast of the Sea of Galilee. And when we go to Israel, we always take time to go up there. It's just a little bit to the uh, east of Tel Dan. We start, talked about Tel Dan on Tuesday nights in, in, in Judges recently. And it's a, it's a tremendous location because the backdrop that you see at Caesarea uh, Philippi is the backdrop of this enormous rock escarpment. And so it is against that background that Jesus is going to talk about that it is on this rock, and he's referring to himself, that I will build my church. So after the disciples asked them, ask these questions and they give erroneous answers uh, 
He says to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, and he said, you are the Messiah. Recently, I read a testimony from a uh, Jewish individual who got saved. And part of what transpired in the conversation with them is that they were, uh, whoever was witnessing to them, explained to them that Jesus Christ, Christ is not his last name. It is the translation of Messiah. And so actually in the scripture, what you have is Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. And that was an eye-opening uh, reality for this, for this individual. And that's what it was with Peter. They realized that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of the living God. Now that's just really significant because the idea of the son, we'll talk about later as we go through this series, it goes back to uh, Psalm 2 that uh, the Messiah will be declared to be the Son of God. And so it's a recognition here of a lot. He's putting together these Old Testament prophecy, messianic prophecies, and seeing that this is who Jesus is. He is the promised and prophesied Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus' response was, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, Simon son of John, uh, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And he goes on in the next verse to say, and I also say to you that you are Peter and on this rock, and there's a lot of people who, because of the play of words here, you have Petros for rock, that's the Greek word for rock, and then there's his name, uh, Peter, But Jesus is talking about himself. All through the Old Testament, God is referred to as the rock. Jesus is referred to as the rock in 1 Corinthians uh, 10, 4. That he is the, that when Moses struck the rock, that is Christ. So when he says this, he's building his church on himself. He's the chief cornerstone. And he says the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And in this artist's rendition of what it looked like at the time of Christ, there were these uh, temples here. Uh, The one on the left covered the opening to a cave. Legend said that that was one of the entries to Hades. And so against this backdrop, Jesus is using this huge rocky escarpment as a uh, metaphor for for himself. He's the rock. He is. A, it's not just some small rock or small stone or even a, a big liftable rock. It's something he's referencing here. So that's the backdrop. And what he means is he says the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So the question he asks is the question we're answering. Who do men say that I am? And last time, just by way of review, we saw that there were a a number of passages that in the early church brought a measure of confusion uh, to people. In John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Clear indication that the logos here, you have to understand that word, that's really important in some of the things we're going to study in the coming weeks. The Logos was God, a clear statement that he is undiminished deity. John 10.30, he said, I and my Father are one. Uh, John 14.9, he asked Peter, he says, have you, uh, have, how long have you been with me and you don't know me? If you've, seen the fa- if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And then uh, there are other passages that seem to indicate that there's a distinction. Jesus doesn't quite seem to know everything. Um, we talked last time about the personification of Jesus as wisdom in the, in the Proverbs, and there, that was an allegorical understanding. But there it says wisdom is brought forth, indicating there's a time for its beginning. Mark 10, 18, Jesus said, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. And 1 Timothy 2, 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. So it looks like he's something less than God, 
And then he's described in the appositional phrase, the man, Christ Jesus. So the early church struggled with how do you put these things together? They would affirm on the one hand that Jesus was fully God. On the other hand, that they were fu- he was fully man. But th- nobody was saying, well, how do you put that together? How do you explain it? In what way is he God? In what way is he man? Is he half God? Is he half man? Is he part part man, all God? How do you understand all this? And so we come to this passage in Philippians 2, 5 through 11, which, 5 through 11, which is one of the most important passages to understand when we ask the question, who is Jesus? Understanding that particular point. And so uh, the context is important to understand this. That's what we've seen, that the context in the first four verses is talking about humility, that Paul isn't writing these verses in 2, 5 through 11 as a theological treatise. He's, he's giving this example to the, Corinth, to, I mean, to the Philippians so they can understand how they are to live in humility and in unity with one another, serving one another. And uh, so it starts with uh, Christ Jesus, who he is, and it clearly indicates and assumes a pre-existence before his incarnation. And in that pre-existence, he's undiminished deity. Now, just because they believed in a pre-existence and just because the passage indicates a pre-existence, the next question is, does that mean he's eternal? And that was a question that consumed uh, the uh, early church, uh, especially in the early part of the 300s. And leading up to and is the reason for the calling of the Council of Nicaea was to settle this issue. Was Jesus a preexistent? And if so, was he eternal? And that was the Arian controversy. Uh, was G- Jesus could have been preexistent, but he could have been created at some time uh, in eternity past before God created the angels or before God created Uh, the heavens and the earth in Genesis 1. So that's that's going to be a question. And this is a fundamental issue. And so the third point, we learned that the focus in this description of Christ is on his willingness to restrict his use of divine prerogatives to take on the form of a human, the form of a servant, Uh, with the essence of a servant, which is to be the kind of thinking that should characterize our thinking. So what we see here is that the intricacies of theology are not just some ivory tower uh, scholastic debate about um, minutia or about details, but about very significant aspects of the person of Christ and other areas of theology because they have practical significance. And if Jesus isn't God, fully God, as um, was understood later on in the debates over the hypostatic union, then we don't have a sufficient sacrifice for salvation. And as Athanasius understood in this debate, if he isn't uh, fully God, we don't have that, that sufficient sacrifice. And if he isn't fully human, he can't be a substitute for humans. So it took another hundred years to really hammer out some of this. And we just take it for granted because we've heard it so often. Uh, so we'll, we're going to go through uh, this and it'll help us think more clearly about the concepts we already know and understand. So the emphasis in all these descriptions uh, that we saw in the first four verses relate to the care, concern, and comfort which we have been given in Christ. And that in turn is what we should give others. So God's grace in action has provided that comfort. His grace in action is an expression of his love. Uh, We are to love one another as God loved us. So all of this ties together in understanding grace orientation, understanding humility, understanding love, uh, 
understanding that humility is related to obedience and without humility you don't have love. All of those things tie together here. Third thing, there, therefore there's no basis because we all have received the same grace. We all have been uh, identified with Christ and put into the body of Christ as a, on the basis of God's grace and on the basis of Christ's death on the cross. That therefore there is no basis in the body of Christ for superiority, for arrogance, for competition, for anybody's egos to get involved as to who's, who's more important or less important. Every member of the body of Christ uh, is important. Uh, and we are all to serve one another in, uh, from humility and concern more for others than for self. That just goes back to Le- Leviticus 19.18 Loving, one, uh, loving our neighbor as ourself. So the example is serving through humility. But to do that, you really have to understand what was going on in the incarnation. So that's what we're supposed to learn is about our new identity in Christ and the significance of that in removing uh, pride and ambition and self-serving attitudes from the body. And uh, as a result... We should think in terms of the unity being single-minded in terms of our mission in the body of Christ. Now, John Walvoord, who's the president of Dallas Theological Seminary, and he is often considered to be um, the the most articulate spokesperson for Chafer. Actually, if you read a lot of Walvoord's early writings, that, that pretty much just sounds like he's Uh, rewriting Chafer and explaining him uh, in a little easier to understand language. But he wrote a volume that came out in the early 60s on Christology called Jesus Christ Our Lord in which he says, related to Philippians 2, 5 to 11, that the action of Christ in proceeding from glory to become man and to suffer on the cross as an illustration of the mind of Christ. In the accompanying explanation, the apostle gave one of the most concise theological statements of the incarnation to be found anywhere in Scripture. So this is a foundational passage. So if you want to really understand key passages on on Christ, on the incarnation, you go to uh, Philippians 2, You go to John 1, Colossians 1 and 2, and Hebrews 1. If you can just remember the chapters, you can get there and find the verses. So in verse 3, Paul says, Not thinking according to selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, which is a really sort of antiquated way of saying just humility, But it brings together, as I pointed out last time, this word that it translates, tapaina frasune. And as I pointed out last time, I've color-coded this so you can see the syllables. The black letters are the root word, tapaino. You see it also over here in the verb, taipanao, tapainao. That has the idea of being low, being humble. Um, It can be you're down and depressed in mental attitude. It can be that you're economically poor, or it just has a mental attitude of of humility. The F, the uh, uh, phi, rho, omicron, the fro, represents the root of phreneo, which means to think. And then the last syllable, sune, means the quality of something. Like dikaya sune is the quality of righteousness. So this is the quality of thinking in a humility. And so all through these first verses and down into the example of Christ, you have various forms of this word. And it is related to... Uh, humility, and then we have the word for phreneo and another word, hegeomai, emphasizing thought. See, we live in a world where everybody emphasizes emotion. You know where that came from? 
It really started in the, with the father of modern liberalism, a German theologian by the name of Friedrich Schleiermacher, who said, well, we can't trust the Bible. The Bible really isn't uh, our ultimate authority. The only thing that we have to validate anything related to God is how it makes us feel. As long as we can get a feeling of God consciousness, then we're saved. That's how he was defining salvation. And that dominated European Protestant liberalism, and then we brought it across the ocean in the uh, mid to late 1800s, and it began to dominate in American churches, and most of the mainstream denominations all bought into this emotion as the center of how you know anything about God. Jesus used this language frequently related uh, to himself, and in, state, in Luke 14, 11, uh, stating a basic principle that is the foundation of what we have in Philippians 2. Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, he said, take my yoke. See, it was an idiom that the Pharisees, if you became a disciple of a school of Pharisees, then you took their yoke, their, all their rules and regulations on yourself, and it was heavy, and it was rigorous, and it was burdensome. So Jesus says, take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and humble. In heart, same word. Here it is the word uh, typanos, the noun. Humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Then he uses the verb, which is on the right, tap, tapanao, for whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus is going to be exalted by the Father because he humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death on the cross. I also mentioned the quote in Proverbs 3.34, Surely he scorns the scornful, but gives grace to the humble. That's quoted in James 4.6 and 1 Peter 5.5 5 and 6. James 4.6 says, But he gives more grace. Therefore he said, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. In other passages, Ephesians 4.2, We are to be characterized by lowliness, by humility. And gentleness, Colossians 3.12, as the choice ones of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, and long-suffering. That should characterize our thinking and characterize our lives. 1 Peter 5.5, 5, Peter's talking to the younger people. They are to be submissive to their elders, and everyone should be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. And again, quotes from Proverbs, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So we're, e we're commanded to think a certain way. Philippians 2, 3, in humility of mind, let each one think others better than themselves. So it's all about thinking. This same uh, word in the verb form is stated in Philippians 2, 8, Christ humbled himself. So it just, this, wor this word group and the word group for thinking run like two different threads just wound together all the way through these verses to think in terms of humility. It's not an emotion. It's not a feeling. It is a mental attitude. So the early church asked these questions. What was Jesus before he came? If he was eternal God, then are there more than one God? Are there two gods? Are there three gods? How do we put this together? Second, they asked, if he was created, then how can he be God if he's not eternal? That was so important for understanding he has to be fully God. Otherwise, we don't have salvation. How do we understand these apparent contradictory passages? So uh, the illustration started in Philippians 2.5. And the command is to let this mind or this mindset or this mentality or this mental attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So it's a present active imperative I pointed out last time, which means it is to be a continuous standard for us, how we reason our mental attitude. Philippians 2.6 indicates that 
who Jesus was before he came. The New King James translates it, who, referring to Jesus, being in the form of God. Now, I, I like the way they translate that. The word that we have here that we'll see in a minute as we understand this phrase, being in the form of God, that that indicates his continued existence. And so the translators of the King James understood this as having, uh, even though technically in the grammar, it may be uh, past tense. I'll explain that in a minute. But it has, really it has the sense of a present tense because Jesus continually exists. It almost has, an, uh, uh, the, the present tense can be used with that kind of what grammar, grammarians call a perf imperfect sense, continuous action in past time that continues into the present. So that's this issue. What does being indicate? His past or his present? Uh, what does it mean that he's in the form of God? Is that shape or something else? And what does robbery have to do with the equality of God? So we looked at these things, and that verb translated being is on the left. It's huparko, which is a word for existence or being. It's, it's a, sim a, a, a synonym for the word for to be, to exist. Uh, so it, it indicates that since it's a present active and part participle, it has a present sense, but it's tied to an aorist finite verb. So the rule of grammar is that a present tense participle is, is action that happens at the same time as the verb. But since we're talking about Jesus, who's eternal, it's really more than that, but that's a theological conclusion, not just a grammatical conclusion. So it has that idea of, of he was continuously in the form of God before he entered into human history. So that gets us pre-existence. The second phrase, which is the form of God, uh, is what gets us his uh, eternal attributes, all of the attributes uh, uh, of deity. We'll get to that in the next slide. So basically what this is saying, at some point in the distant past, Christ Jesus existed continuously in the form of God. And at some point, he didn't consider that something to be grasped after. He's not going to hold on to it. He's, he's willing to limit himself or willing to, in some sense, the verb really has the idea of emptying, but it doesn't mean that, that he gets rid of all of his divine attributes. So he existed in the form of God, which I told you last time has the idea of the nature of something. And this is, this is very important to understand. We think of the form of something as its external shape. But in the Greek thinking, the form of something was what made it what it is. So you have one kind of chair up here on the podium. You have another kind of chair over here with the choir. But we know they're both chairs because they share a certain something in common, what we might call chairness. It's something that is not physical. It is something that has to do with understanding the nature of what it is. So the Greeks understood that the form represented something even more basic, and that was an underlying essence or underlying attributes. So when we look at this, we could translate it, although he existed in the es with the essence of God, although he existed as essential uh, deity, he did not think that equality with God. Now, that's another important phrase. He was equal with God. That means he has to be undiminished deity. That means he has to possess each and every attribute of God to the same extent. Otherwise, he wouldn't be equal, would he? So he has to have all of the attributes of God, and it has to have them in the same measure. That was before the incarnation. Now, when we talk about this word, 
couple of other words that are used uh, along with being that you'll find are his subsistence or his existing. It's his being. It's how he existed before the incarnation. It's in this form of God that is the essence of God. But the fact that he, his being was in the form of God does not indicate that once he emptied himself, that's the verb we'll see in the next verse, that's, uh, that's the big debate is over theologically, that he no longer possessed these, uh, these range of divine attributes the same. So what you had was liberals who would come along and others trying to explain this would say that he divested himself of these attributes or that he divested himself of some of these attributes. But those who stuck closely to the scripture recognized that that, that's, that was all wrong. You could, he couldn't divest himself of any of his attributes Otherwise, he would no longer be God. And we'll see that there are passages that clearly state that in the incarnation, he is still full God and undiminished deity. So that he never lost the full range of that which made him God. But there's something apparently secondary to the attributes of God that relates to his way of of doing things that is going to somehow be restricted. That's what comes up. Now, Chafer wrote in his Systematic Theology that all the passages which affirm his deity after the incarnation, and there are many, establish the fact that deity was not surrendered or any attribute thereof when he became flesh. A change of position or relationship is implied, but no surrender of essential being is indicated, nor is such a surrender possible. And so he lists several, uh, several verses. A couple of these are, uh, I'll go through real briefly. Colossians 1.19. You know, when I go through the list and I say, you got to look at, you want to know about the Christ? Hebrews 2, John 1, Colossians 1, Hebrews 1. Okay, in Colossians 1, it's Colossians 1, 19. For it pleased the Father that in Him, that is in Christ, in the incarnation, all the fullness should dwell. Now you ought to ask the question, well, fullness of what? Well, that's covered in, one, uh, or in 2, 9. For in him, that is in Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So these two verses put together indicate that Jesus it was fully God in the incarnation. Then you have 1 Timothy 3.16. And without controversy, Paul wrote, is the, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. That's what the name Emmanuel means in the Hebrew, God with us. So he was manifested in the flesh. And then Titus 2.13, in an interesting construction in the Greek, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. Now this is actually one of those examples of the Granville Sharp rule that you have uh, one article that governs two nouns. It can't govern proper nouns, but in English, God and Savior are proper nouns, but they aren't in Greek. Okay, so you have one article governing this so that God and Savior both apply to the same person, Jesus Christ. So these are just some of the passages that emphasize the deity of Jesus after the Incarnation. Very clear. John 1.14 says that the Word, that remember in John 1.1, 1, 1, the Word was with God and the Word was God. And in verse 14, we learn that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, 
full of grace and truth. See, we keep reading that word full. You know, that means it's undiminished. He is loaded up with 100% of the uh, attributes of deity. And then Jesus, in his high priestly prayer in John 17, 5, prays to the Father, and now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself. Now, remember, he's praying this just before he gets arrested in Gethsemane. He's going to be taken to the praetorium where he is going to be uh, tried, and then he's going to be turned over to the soldiers, and they're going to... uh, They are just going to whip him to no end and beat him up and and pummel him until he is just a bloody mess and can hardly carry the cross piece of his cross very far. And so he prays, Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. So he clearly understood that glory is the entirety of the attributes of God. That's what makes him glorious is all that he is. So Jesus clearly recognized he is fully, fully God. And that all of that, all of his, uh, that he would uh, remove the restrictions that he had voluntarily, voluntarily taken upon himself. So when we go back to look at the verses, the verse that we're translating, it's who, although he eternally existed with identical essence to God, which includes eternality and infinity. So he's infinite in knowledge. He's infinite in his presence. He's infinite in his power. His righteousness is infinite. His justice is infinite. His love is infinite. Everything is infinite. And he is eternal. All of that was his before he entered into human history. So he says, who eternally existed with identical essence to God, did not think. Now when was it that he didn't think this? And what part of him is doing the thinking? Is this his deity or his humanity? Well, if you follow when this is taking place, it's before the incarnation. The incarnation comes as a result of his uh, not thinking his, his position with God was worthy of grasping. So it's his deity that's thinking that. In his deity, he did not think that, that uh, his position with God was w- w- worthy of being grasped, seized after. And that is the next word we see here, harpagmas, which is related to uh, harpazo, the Greek word for snatch, to grab, to seize something. And that's in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, that the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. The dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. That's harpazo. Shall be, we, it was translated into Latin with the verb uh, rapto. So that's where we get our English word rapture. So you'll find people who say, well, you know, the word rapture isn't found in the Bible. Well, neither is the word trinity. But the rapture is clearly there because it's the Latin translation of harpazo. But this is the idea of grasping or grabbing something. So Jesus did not think it was robbery or something to seize or take to be equal with God. Now, Satan wanted to seize that because he wanted to be equal with God. And Adam and Eve, what was the temptation in the garden? If you God, God doesn't want you to eat the fruit because then you'll be like him. And so Eve thought that it was good, saw that it was good to eat, and she ate it because she wanted to be like God. And then Adam wanted to be like God. So they are seizing something they did not have. Jesus had it. And he's not willing to seize it because he wants to be a servant. That's where we go in in the verse. He did not think equality with God a claim to be selfishly grasped after. So what happens? Well, the second question we ask is, after we ask what was he before he came, was what was he when he came? 
verse 7 says, but, he, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Now, here's the way this verse is translated in different English translations. The top one is the New King James Version. But made himself of no reputation. The Greek word that we'll see there is that verb kanao, where we get the noun kenosis. But we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, the ESV translate it, translates it, but emptied himself. Because that you look the word up in the Greek dictionary, and that's what it means, to empty yourself or to uh, limit something. He emptied himself. How did he do that? See, he emptied himself. This is, this is sort of an um, ir- irony here. He empties himself by taking something to himself. Usually you think of emptying yourself by getting rid of something. See, he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. NASB translates it very similarly but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant. And the uh, Holman Christian Standard Bible, instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form. Now, the word for form all the way through here is the same word we saw with the form of God. So he's taking on the essence, the attributes of a servant. Remember, Jesus came, I came, said he came to seek and to serve that which was lost. So Philippians 2, 7 starts with this contrast, contrasting to that, thinking that it was something to be grasped after, but he willingly limited himself. I, I think that's a better translation. It has the idea of, of what kanao is. It's emptying himself of certain privileges or re- willingly restricting those privileges. The word here is the word in the middle, kanao. It is uh, aorist tense, basically a simple past, to make empty, to render void, or to divest himself. That's how the uh, Greek lexicon uh, says it can be translated. It's in that range of ideas. And he, he empties himself. It's reflexive. He does it willingly to himself. God doesn't make him. God doesn't make him become a servant. He willingly accepts this, accepts the form of a servant in addition to existing in the form of God. So this tells us he has all the attributes of deity, and now he has the attributes of a servant. And he's got the attributes of a servant in terms of a true human, which is the next statement, coming in the likeness of men, I think that word is chosen because he's not in the likeness of anyone since Adam. He's not, in a, he's not a sinner. He's in the likeness, he just like Adam was created, absolutely sinless. So he's taking on the form of a servant, not as an authority, over men, but to serve them. So he uh, limits himself, and then the word that is translated taking is actually the word in the lower left, lambano, which means to take or to receive something. And it's, um, it's an uh, aorist active participle that indicates the means, he he's, he's limits himself by means of receiving the form of a servant. So the the, the limitation comes by adding true humanity to his undiminished deity. And so in some way, the infinite becomes finite, but he doesn't lose his divine attributes. But in some way, he's restricting them so that he can uh, be finite and so that he can serve the human race by going to the cross as as our sacrifice so we can translate it he emptied himself by receiving the essence the same thing the attributes the essence of a servant same word we had 
or the essence or attributes of God. So putting those two verses together, we read, who, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, although eternally existing with identical essence to God, did not think it robbery or something to be seized to be equal with God, but willingly restricted himself by receiving the nature of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of humanity. So there's a challenge, though. And the challenge is trying to understand what this means, that he emptied himself. Now, Chafer summarizes it this way. He says the kenosis theory, because that's what it is. It is a theory that came out of the, out of the liberal wing of Protestantism. You don't find anybody going this way prior to the 19th century. He says the kenosis theory is usually an extreme view of Christ's self-emptying, which self-emptying took place at the incarnation when he exchanged what may be termed the eternal mode of existence for that related to time. From the form of God to the form of a servant or bond slave. See, I would word it a little differently. He's still in the form of God, but he takes on, in addition, the form of a servant. Chaffer goes on to say certain penalties or forfeitures were involved in this exchange, which by the unbelieving, that is these liberal theologians, Uh, have been enlarged beyond the warrant of Scripture. He goes on to say, naturally the phrase emptied himself may suggest to those whose minds so demand, that is the unbelieving, the notion that he divested himself of all divine attributes. And see, there are some that say that. That means he he gave up all his divine attributes. He's not, he doesn't have any divine attributes. And there are some that have come close to suggesting that by, by saying that Jesus did everything he did in the incarnation by the Spirit. And that's not true. He did, it, it's only mentioned a couple of times that he did a miracle by means of the Spirit. But he did many of his miracles, such as stilling the storm, changing the water into wine, multiplying the loaves and the fishes. He did this to show that he was God and that he could do it, that he was omnipotent. So he wasn't doing it to solve his own problems. You don't see him being tempted when he's taken out in the wilderness, and he fasts for 40 days, and Satan comes and tempts him, well, why don't you turn these rocks into bread? And Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone. Jesus could easily do that. He could, he could make the best bread in an instant. But he doesn't use his omnipotence to solve his problems in his humanity because he's willingly restricted the use of those attributes. But at other times, in order to show that he is God, for example, at at the feast, at, at the wedding feast at Cana, he's not turning the water into wine so that he can have plenty of wine to drink. He's turning the water into wine to serve those who are there because they've run out of wine. So, Chafer goes on to say, devout scholars cannot accept this conception. I mean, that, let me, I skip something there. To those whose minds, that is the unbeliever, so demand the notion that he divested himself of all divine attributes. But devout scholars, in other words, believers who stick to the scriptures, cannot accept this conception And they evidently have not only the support of context, but that of all Scripture. See, that's one of the things we're going to look at in the coming weeks. We're going to look at how all of Scripture, I mean, not just theological conceptions, which is what I'm talking about right now, but all of Scripture, we're going to show that Scripture from Genesis to Malachi teaches that the Messiah who comes will be fully God. And we're going to show that it also teaches that the Messiah that comes will be fully man. That this isn't something that Paul developed on his own in the New Testament. So Chafer ends this, that section by saying, the kenosis question is not so much concerned with the humiliation of Christ, that is his suffering, 
uh, as it is with the condense- co- condescension. That is, he's lowering himself to the level of humanity. So the question is, how much does he release? How much is emptied out? How much does he restrict? That really comes the question. So there are these apparent human limitation verses where Jesus says in the upper room discourse regarding his uh, second coming, it's not a rapture passage. He says, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the son, but only the father. In Luke 2.52, says Jesus, as a child increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. You have four areas there. He has intellectual development. He has physical development, his stature, (coughs) and social uh, uh, fellowship with God, in favor with God, and then social in terms of in favor with men. Four areas that we all develop in. Hebrews 5.8 says, Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Now, if he is eternal God, why does he have to learn from the things he suffered? He has to learn in his humanity without sinning. He has to grow in the same way we grow in his humanity. So he's, he's limiting his omniscience so that he has to learn. He, he's, he's not coming to the rabbis and knowing more than they are because he's omniscient and he wrote the scriptures. He's coming and he knows the Torah better than they do because he's been studying it and because of his uh, impeccability, he knows what the accurate interpretation is and he can turn them inside out. Now there's a frequently cited definition here. In hypostatic union, that's the union of humanity and deity together in the one person of Christ. We'll be talking about that in the coming weeks. In hypostatic union, while not relinquishing any attribute of his deity, the emptying doesn't mean he relinquished any attributes of his deity. Jesus Christ willingly restricted the independent use of his divine attributes. And I highlighted the word independent. I'll tell you why in a minute. He willingly restricted the independent use of his divine attributes in compliance with the Father's plan for the incarnation. Hebrews 2, 6 to 11, and Hebrews 10, 5 to 7. Thus he establishes in his humanity a prototype spiritual life which in is the precedent for the operational spiritual life of the church age believer. Now this phrase willingly restricted the independent use of his divine attributes can be traced in this instance to John Walvert, but that he did voluntarily restrict their independent use. But it didn't originate with with Walbert. As he says in the last line, he says the summary, which is given by Augustus H. Strong, who's a well-known turn of the last century Baptist theologian uh, who wrote a a fairly decent systematic theology, uh, used this terminology. But my, my, my question has been for the last 20 years, Jesus is submissive to the Father. Was he ever not submissive to the Father? Was the second person of the Trinity ever not submissive to the Father? No. Did the second person of the Trinity billions of years ago act independently of the Father's will? Never. So the term independent is not necessary. It's superfluous to add this. He voluntarily restricted their use. You don't ha- I know what they're trying to say. They're trying to just reinforce the idea that, that he was in, totally in line with the Father's purposes and he wasn't going to do something like try to solve his problems in his humanity apart from the Father's will. But as a second person of the Trinity, he never did. He never acted independently. So it's a, it's a superfluous term that got introduced into the language of dealing with kenosis in the late 19th century. I don't think it needs to be there. 
I'm willing to be corrected. But so far, in 20 years of discussing this with a lot of guys, I haven't had anybody say anything other than, I never thought of that before. All right. So, in understanding this kenosis, our, um, our doctrine of Christ's humiliation is better understood if we put it between the pairs of these erroneous views making it the third of the five. We have a theologian named Guess. I'm not familiar with him. He basically took the position of of what um, Charles Feinberg called absolute divine suicide. The Logos gave up all divine attributes. In other words, he he wouldn't be deity anymore. Well, that was, that was that solution. Others, such as a very well-known evangelical commentator by the name of Louis Godet, took the same position, that he gives up, up his uh, attributes altogether. Second, you have Thomasius, and he said the Logos gave up relative attributes only. Now, there's a number of people who take that view, that you've got absolute attributes like his omniscience, omnipotence, omnipresence, but you have some relative, abs- relative uh, attributes also. So he gave up the relative but not the absolute. Well, all, a- all absolute and relative attributes work together in the deity of God. So if you give up the relative, you're giving up half, your, half the deity. So that's, that's what's wrong with that particular position. The true view is that, uh, and according to this one author, he used the word independent exercise of divine attributes. Uh, that was his view. Old orthodoxy said, uh, Christ gave up the use of divine attributes. Where did I get this? Okay, I got this out of an article. It's very interesting. An article was written on the kenosis by Alva J. McLean. Now, Alva J. McLean should be a well-known name to anyone who's gone to Bible college or seminary. Alva J. McLean wrote a book called The Greatness of the Kingdom, which is a shorter version than the three volumes of uh, George N. H. Peters on the Theocratic Kingdom, which is basically the view that... that um, that I hold on the kingdom and that many others that you've heard from like Andy Woods and Tommy Ice and Randy Price, we all hold to the position that's articulated in such detail by both George and H. Peters and Alva J. McLean. What's interesting, McLean was the theologian at Grace Theological Seminary in Winona Lake, Indiana, and he was a pre-mill, pre-trib dispensationalist. But his article is so outstanding on the kenosis that he wrote it in the 30s. In the early 60s, it's reprinted by Grace Seminary. Of course, he taught there, so they would be the ones to come back and reprint. They didn't didn't print the original one, but in their journal in the 60s, they reprinted it. And then Westminster Theological Seminary, which is an Amil Calvinist seminary, printed it. So they're publishing an article by a pre-mill dispensationalist because it is such an outstanding article on the kenosis, which doesn't have anything to do with the eschatology issues. But this is how how he broke this thing down. And the only argument I have uh, is his use of that word independent, and he attributes it back to Strong as well. So uh, the fourth view, old orthodoxy, Christ gave up the use of his divine attributes. And that's not quite right because he did use them, but not for his own purposes. And then Anselm, who was around the 11th century, around 1000 AD, and was the Archbishop of Canterbury, and well known because he was the first to articulate clearly in theological language the substitutionary atonement of Christ on the cross. Okay? He's the first to clearly make that known, that Christ died in our place. Now, that doesn't mean people didn't have a vague understanding of that before, but he's the first one to really tear it apart, put it back together, and explain why it's necessary on the basis of types in the Old Testament and and, uh, everything else. 
So he said that Christ acted as if he did not possess divine attributes. So historically, those are some of the different positions. You can't tell that I'm teaching history of doctrine this semester, can you? So the Son of God willingly veiled his pre-incarnate glory by giving up the outer appearance of God, his glory, and ordered to take the form and function of a finite human body. That's where he mentions this, giving up this glory in John 17, 5. Second, we see that Christ willingly submitted to the Father's will to restrict the use of his divine attributes in relation to the tests, temptations, and struggles he faced in his incarnation, in his humanity. In Hebrews 10, 5 through 7, we read, Therefore, when he came into the world... Referring to Jesus, he said, quoting from the Old Testament, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me, indicating God specifically prepared his body that he became incarnate in. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, at some time in eternity past, Jesus is, says this, behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me, to do your will, O God. That's the kenosis. He willingly submits to the authority of God. Only two times, third point is only two times out of probably dozens or hundreds of miracles is it stated that he performed these in the power of the Holy Spirit. So you can't extrapolate that to all of them. In many miracles, Christ performed them in his own omnipotence to demonstrate that he is fully God. Matthew 12, 28 says, If I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. And in Luke 4, 14, and 15, uh, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. Those are the only two places that state that. So in Philippians 2, 7, we read that he willingly restricted himself by receiving the essence of a bondservant, and by having come into existence, that's the idea of genomai, to come into being, uh, coming into existence in the likeness of men. And that word likeness has the idea uh, also of the essence of humanity. So we break it down this way. He willingly restricted himself by receiving the essence or the nature of a servant or slave and by coming into existence in the essence of a human. What kind of man was he? What did he do? Philippians 2.8 says, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient, or by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death of, of the cross. So by being found, it's simply a straight translation of the Greek verb, by being found in appearance, which is the word schema, which indicates the uh, outward form. Uh, he has the body of a man, physical body of a man. He humbled himself. That's our word typonao all over again, going back and tying the thread together and all these uses throughout this section. He humbled himself, and then the next word is genomai. It's a participle, and it should be understood as an instrumental participle. How did he humble himself? By being obedient. What is humility? Humility is authority orientation. Humility isn't some a humble person isn't somebody who's just walked all over. A humble person is a person who's obedient to the authorities that are over them. And that's why Moses was said by God to be one of the most, to be the most humble person in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it's Jesus. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And for that reason, because he humbled himself, he restricted his use of these of his divine attributes according to the plan of God. God highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name which is above every name that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess uh, 
that Jesus Christ is Lord. So who was Jesus when he came? Well, we have to answer the question first, who was Jesus before he came? And what we're going to do is we first have to understand who God is. God is both a unity and a plurality. So we're just going to touch on that, what that means. And then address the question, did Jesus pre-exist creation? And if so, is his pre-existence eternal? So we're going to go through Scripture. We're going to distinguish pre-existence from eternality by looking at passages which indicate his eternality. Passages in the Old Testament that teach his pre-existence. Passages which predict the coming of the Messiah. Passages which indicate his humanity passages which indicate his deity, and then we'll shift to passages in the Gospels which indicate his humanity and his deity. So that's general progress that we'll do over the next uh, week or two, establishing a basic understanding of who Jesus is. 50% of what is covered in basic Christology. So we'll come back next time and start to work our way through the scriptures. Then after we've worked our way through the scriptures, we'll go through a little bit of the history and how it came to be articulated the way it's articulated today. Father, we thank you for this uh, time to study, to reflect, to strain our brains on putting together the deity and the humanity of Christ in one person, understanding clearly what the passage says, before we come back and understand fully what it means for us in terms of interpretation. So, Father, we pray that we might uh, recognize that at some degree this just goes beyond our finite understanding, but we can understand what you have revealed in your word. And for that, we're thankful. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.